We're going to start off thermodynamics by looking at some of the properties of gases because gases are the simplest form of matter and we can get some nice uh, equations about how they behave and what they do uh, that we can perhaps extend a little bit into other more complicated forms or states of matter. So we're going to start off with the ideal gas equation which we know from Gen Chem or the ideal gas equation of state or ideal gas law if you prefer. And that's that the pressure of a gas P times its volume V equals the number of moles N times the gas constant R times the temperature T or PV equals NRT as is commonly said. So let's uh, define another quantity quickly that we might find useful and that's V bar or the molar volume of the gas and that's the amount of volume which it takes to occupy for one mole of gas to occupy and that's going to be the volume divided by the number of moles. So how many how many liters of gas or meters cubed of gas does it take for one mole to occupy that? And if we use V bar then we have the ideal gas equation becomes PV bar equals RT. We've just divided both sides by N and now we have V over N V bar PV bar equals NRT divided by N it's just going to be RT. So this ideal gas equation that is going to be true if a gas is said to be behaving ideally. So a gas that behaves ideally is just one that obeys the ideal gas law or just that the pressure times the volume equals NRT here. Okay, so what under what conditions is that going to be the case? That's going to be the case under conditions where the pressure is going to zero, so where the gas is very dilute. As the pressure goes to zero, all gases behave ideally. And again, that is just a limit in the limit of very low pressure. And why is that important? So as we get to lower and lower pressures, at very high pressures, the gas particles will be packed. They're going to collide into each other. They're going to interact with each other. And whatever their, whatever energy exists between these gas molecules interacting is going to affect this equation. So it's not going to behave ideally. Whereas as it gets more dilute, the gas molecules are spread further and further apart and they interact less and less and then in the limit of a very dilute gas the gas molecules only see themselves they don't see others so they're not going to interact with each other and a perfectly non-interacting gas will obey this type of law this PV equals NRT. Okay so this actually gives us a nice way to calculate the quantity temperature as we'll see later on the the quantity for temperature is quite difficult to define in some cases. So we can define temperature as with an operational definition that we can define temperature to be the limit as pressure goes to zero of P V bar over R. So why is this true? Well if we take PV and we divide by NR we're going to get PV bar over R and then we'll just have T left by itself here. So if a gas is behaving ideally then the temperature will equal the pressure times the molar volume divided by the gas constant. And in the limit that pressure goes to zero all gases behave ideally. So therefore in the limit of low pressure our temperature is going to be this pressure times molar volume divided by the gas constant. So let's talk a little more about pressure for a second and what type of units we expect there. So for pressure, we have the unit Pascal in SI units, and that is equal to 1 Newton per meter squared. And we notice the quantity P times V, this quantity on the left here. So we have 1 Pascal times the quantity for volume in SI units would be meters cubed, 1 pascal per cubic meter. That's going to be 1 newton per meter squared times meter cubed. That will be 1 newton times meter, 
which is a joule. A joule is one newton times meter, and that is a unit of energy. So there's a certain amount of energy contained in a gas with a certain amount of pressure and a certain amount of volume. So if we, <clears throat> if we change the amount of uh, pressure and volume, as long as we keep the temperature constant of an ideal gas, we're not going to affect the amount of energy which is contained by that gas because you're just kind of exchanging the energy there. There's going to be uh, the same amount of energy in that total box of gas, whether it's very large or very small, as long as you have the same number of particles at the same temperature. Okay, then some other relevant units of temper of pressure there that you might come across. We have one atmosphere, which is equal to 101,325 pascals. So pascal is quite a small unit of pressure. And that's also equal to 101.325 kilopascals. And then this is also equal to another common unit of pressure that is millimeters of mercury. And the millimeters of mercury unit just comes from you assume you have some type of basin of mercury here and then there is you know the mercury is sitting down here in this basin and the atmospheric air is pushing down on the mercury. So the mercury inside of a sealed tube here is just going to rise up some height and that gets pushed down by the pressure of gravity and then there's just going to be some distance in which this sealed tube rises above the, the little basin there. And that height is just going to be the height that you measure for the millimeters of mercury. And it's just been observed that that is 760 for one atmospheric level of pressure. And these are these are linear, so you can do uh, pretty much uh, proportions to figure out what it would be at, say, two atmospheres, three atmospheres, etc. They will just uh, scale proportionally to one another. And lastly, we want to talk about a little bit about intensive and extensive properties. So V bar, the molar volume, that is going to be independent of the number of particles in the system. It's independent of n because it has divided by n in it. So it doesn't scale with the number of particles there. It's the volume held by one mole of particles. That doesn't change based off how many particles you have. And some a property which holds that type of relationship is said to be intensive. So some other examples of intensive properties that you see in, in gases include pressure. Pressure doesn't depend on the number of particles, all other things being equal. Temperature doesn't depend on the number of particles, all other things being equal. And also the density of a substance, again, all other things being equal. But what about if we look at just volume? So volume is going to scale proportionally with the number of particles, all other things being equal. So a, a property with this type of relationship that scales linearly with the number of particles is going to be said to be an extensive property. It scales with the size of the system. It extends as the system extends. So some other examples of some extensive properties that we come across. The number of particles, obviously. As the number of particles increases, the number of particles increases. So that one's true by definition. Um, the total mass of the system. So if we have twice the amount of gas, then we have twice the mass. And if we have twice the amount of twice the number of particles, we will have twice the energy in there, provided they're at the same uh, pressure, temperature, etc. All right, so that's intensive and extensive properties, and those are going to be important to keep in mind for uh, some applications later on. And then lastly, I just want to mention about this value of this uh, gas constant here. And this R in SI units, say, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. 
So this, this mole Kelvin, those are both on the denominator there. They are being divided by. So that says if you have one mole of gas at one degree at one Kelvin, then that is going to contain 8.314 joules of energy. So you have joules per mole Kelvin, you have moles here, and you have Kelvin here. So joule per mole Kelvin times mole times Kelvin gives you joules on the left hand side. So just like a pressure times volume quantity is an energy over here, there's an energy contained by how much space, how much volume and pressure those gas molecules are. There's an energy contained by each particle having a certain unit of temperature. So as your temperature goes up, the energy per particle there is going up as well. So you maybe didn't notice that before, but the energy, the units of each side of this equation are energy. So each of these can be thought as a of as a form of energy and we're going to look at that in terms of um, how that affects the properties and also we're going to look at uh, later on deriving this equation in terms of some more fundamental assumptions.